The March for Science signs are fun. Some clever ones read, Got the Plague? Me neither. Thanks, science. My favorite sign may have been, What do we want? Evidence-based science. When do we want it? After peer review. Then it was the 10-year-old straightforward, Science is the best. This year's energetic March for Science echoed last year's. It was nonpartisan, open to all ages, and you didn't have to be a scientist to march. But scientists did take to the streets, and rarely do scientists come out en masse to support science and its relationship to politics so broadly. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we give you the wide-angle view on science and technology, and we devote one episode a month to critical thinking, skeptic check. Scientists are skeptics by profession, and objectivity is their guiding principle. Yet some scientists are publicly shedding their impartiality to weigh in on political issues. Their activity ranges from marching in demonstrations to scolding legislators. In this episode, the motivation, benefit, and cost of scientists speaking out a record number of them are running for Congress, but is objectivity harmed when scientists turn activists? It's Skeptic Check, Political Scientist. The March for Science in April 2017 was the first time that scientists had mobilized in great numbers to spearhead a movement with a second march in 2018, it's poised to be an annual event. The reason that hundreds of thousands participate are varied. Some call for more research funding, some protest perceived anti-science policies of the administration, and some call for government action on climate change, while others joined in to show support for a scientific, evidence-based approach to life. The last reason seems harmless enough, yet some scientists choose to sit these marches out my name is Rob Young, professor of coastal geology at Western Carolina University, and I haven't participated in the March for Science either last year or this year. Dr. Young outlined his reasons in a 2017 op-ed for The New York Times. He says they didn't change a year later. I consider this to be a strategic question, and I think that the March for Science is bad strategy. To begin with, I don't feel like the march is going to change anything. You know, it might be a way for scientists and advocates for scientists to get together as a community and sort of commiserate. But strategically, it, it's not going to change the way that science is appreciated or portrayed within the current administration. Then you, you worry about whether or not the march might actually do some harm. And when scientists blend a march together with sort of the environmental movement, then it's a little bit too easy for those who are skeptical about science and scientists or those who are professionally trying to dismiss science to portray scientists as being, you know, another interest group. And, you know, that doesn't help me do my job. What other forms of political action then would you recommend? Well, I don't know if you would call it political action per se, but what I really recommend is that scientists, rather than marching together in a group on Washington, march into their local communities and meet people, uh, serve on planning boards, go give talks at the Rotary and Ruritan, build those bridges into communities that have lost touch, not just with science, but with academia in general and remind them why science really matters in their lives and introduce them to a real science. So the next time they're thinking about a scientific issue, they'll actually see a face. Robert Young is not the only scientist staying out of the political fray, but overall, resistance for scientists may be futile. Some decisions made on Capitol Hill have important consequences for what goes on in university and government labs, and that means that scientists have long had to play nice with lawmakers. My name is Douglas Haynes. I'm a professor of history at UC Irvine, where I specialize in the history of medicine and science and technology. Science research and government funding became especially enmeshed after World War II, when it was clear that science was indispensable to the state, and so the government became the biggest funder. But lobbying for funding is just one reason scientists are drawn into politics. Environmental pollution, stem cell technology, nuclear weapons, and climate change there are many issues that prompt scientists to speak out. 
It's unrealistic to think that science and politics can be separate domains, says Dr. Haynes. Well, I think that that assumes that science as a practice is inherently neutral. And I would argue that scientists, both within their own communities, but also as individuals that benefit from federal funding, are also engaged in making arguments about the relevance of what they do. And that gives policymakers to make decisions about funding X versus funding Y. And that is a political process. Well, let's take a look at that history because, you know, you think back to the 19th century uh, and even the 18th century, you had scientists, of course. I don't know that they were always called scientists, maybe natural philosophers or something like that. But, you know, they were doing their own thing. And uh, mm -hmm. they, you know, they were gentlemen scientists very often. They were just people who had the time and the wherewithal to build a telescope in their backyard or do whatever they wanted. And there was, I think, uh, rather little uh, interaction with government policy. And then the Second World War comes along and you've got the MIT Rad Lab, Radiation Lab, you know, developing radar. And there were, you know, devices in Britain to decode the Enigma machine, the Manhattan Project. I mean, suddenly science became essential to winning the war. So that changed things, did it not? Yeah, I think what you just described is a nice summary of how both the image of the scientists has changed, but also how science is subsidized. So it's moved from a genteel pursuit to something that is seen as a priority of the state. And as part of their ask to the government, they make the case that understanding, you know, plasma physics will help us better understand some dimension of our life today. Okay, let's go a little bit farther back here. You're an historian of European and American history. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of ethical or political debates were there about science in the 19th century, the Victorians? I, I think one of the larger debates about science had to do with the relationship of knowledge about human evolution and how it applies to human society. And so that's the debate that Charles Darwin and others were at the center of. Where did humans originate from? And I think part of the debate in the 19th century has to do with a new model for understanding ourselves in relationship to time. And sort of in the 19th century, the debate was between a secular understanding and a sacred understanding. And so you can sort of imagine how evolution became a very contested issue among those who had a fairly rigid understanding of where humans originated from. At the heart of that debate was who is an expert? Who is an expert to make that determination? What knowledge do they use? And whether or not that knowledge and that authority is sufficient to most people. So obviously politics bears on science. Clearly it has a role in who gets funded, but also in maybe forming the big picture of what policies we adopt and what way a country's mm -hmm. trajectory will include building on science discovery and technological innovation. So uh, I, I guess the, the conclusion here is science simply cannot remain apolitical. Well, I should say science at its best is not partisan. In other words, that scientists aren't advocating for a position about scientific knowledge based on whether or not they're a member of the Democratic or Republican parties. That you have a methodology that justifies a particular position that is independent of a partisan political affiliation. And in saying that, it's important to remember that, you know, scientists are like other Americans for all practical purposes. They compartmentalize what they do at work and what they believe and practice when it comes to issues of the politics of the day. What's unusual now is that there is a very evident tension between the present administration in Washington and the broad scientific community, in part because the Trump administration is viewed as not only highly critical, but critical without being particularly informed about what science and scientists actually do. 
So, Douglas, it sounds as if this is a somewhat unusual time in history in which scientists feel that they have to get involved in politics. I mean, uh, clearly the development of the A-bomb prompted uh, several scientists to get involved in politics, but it Mm -hmm. wasn't Mm -hmm. common at all before that. And since then, I don't see a whole lot of involvement. Seth, I think you're right. I think what's unprecedented about the visible political activity of scientists as a community is A, that you are beginning to see them publicly advocate for positions, that they are publicly disagreeing with the present administration. And furthermore, I think collectively they feel threatened. And what's at stake, I think, is who is an expert and to what extent the knowledge that experts produce is considered legitimate. So finally, Douglas, when does involvement in politics cross over into activism? Say, I mean, if you appear before Congress to testify, uh, or alternatively, you engage in a march on Washington or chain yourself to a pipeline and so forth, that's advocacy because it's recommending policy. Is the jury still out on that, whether that's a good idea for science? It's important to remember that scientists are part of a larger community of individuals who have different political views. And they nonetheless are still part of a community. And that community can lobby for things. And to the extent that they lobby for things, such as an increased budget to NIH or NSF, they're behaving in a political way. I think that the idea of a scientist chaining themselves to a fence is certainly an expression of political activism, but it's, I would say, the exception rather than the rule. So I think that it is novel to see large numbers of scientists protesting in the streets. I think that we still have a structure where that does not directly affect the integrity of the science itself. What it can do is affect and shape the priorities of funding for science. But beyond that, I think we just have to wait and see how far the tension between the scientific community and the Trump administration goes to understand the lengths by which scientists are prepared to be activists. Douglas Haynes, thanks so very much for being our guest today. Thank you, Seth. I appreciate it. Douglas Haynes is a historian who specializes in the history of medicine, science, and technology at the University of California, Irvine. Later in the show, scientists who are going beyond marching to make a political difference, a record number of scientists are leaving their labs to step into the swamp and head for the hill. But first, the story of a scientist turned reluctant activist. I found myself at the center of this raging debate about human-caused climate change. It's our monthly look at critical thinking on big picture science, skeptic check, political scientist. You know the scene, that one person at the dinner who can speak confidently about what's going on in the world, from business to politics, from science to the arts. Well, there's no chip implanted in their brain. It's simpler than that. They read The Economist. The Economist clues in its readers with what's going on, and not having it is like, I don't know, buying a car without an engine. Facts matter. I just read a really impressive piece on how some of the major oil companies are shifting their strategies away from continuing to simply pump hydrocarbons out of the ground. The Economist covers science and technology, which is something I personally like, of course. So here's the deal for you. The Economist is the smart guide to the forces that are changing your world no matter what you do. You can get a free copy of The Economist by visiting economist.com slash big picture. Enter your details for your free copy delivered direct to your door. You can't beat that. Go to economist.com slash big picture for your free copy. 
You'll be the most interesting person at that dinner tonight. A July 2017 article in New York Magazine begins with the line, It is, I promise, worse than you think. The article outlines a terrifying future in which climate change runs amok, famine, economic collapse, a world that becomes uninhabitable. This doomsday story went viral and it prompted a firm rebuke from researcher Michael Mann. Writing on Facebook, Dr. Mann said that the article's hyperbolic scenarios of climate catastrophe required extraordinary evidence and the article failed to provide it, which sounds like what a climate change skeptic might say. But Michael Mann is an atmospheric scientist at Penn State University and one of the foremost climate researchers in the world. He's authored more than 200 peer-reviewed papers and along with other scientists, contributed to the cumulative research that in 2007 earned the Nobel Peace Prize for efforts to build up and disseminate greater knowledge about man-made climate change. Dr. Mann is one of the most vocal defenders of evidence-based science and publicly takes on climate skeptics and, it should be noted, often with bite. But the New York Magazine article had created a misplaced sense of doom and hopelessness, he wrote. Also, some of its facts were wrong. Michael Mann does not believe that climate change is an intractable problem. It urgently needs addressing. And he's not just sounding an alarm. He's throwing on the lights, pulling off the sheets, and trying to shake those unwilling to act on climate change from their slumber. He leaves no public forum unvisited. He writes books and articles, works social media, attends marches, gives public talks, testifies on Capitol Hill. And the total number of interviews that Dr. Mann gave to reporters in 2017? About 500. And yet, Michael Mann says he became a political activist reluctantly. Back in 1999, when he was a low-profile researcher, he published the now-famous hockey stick graph of Earth's mean average temperatures for the last thousand years, showing a sharp vertical rise in the last hundred. His conclusions were ultimately vindicated after years of being attacked by climate change skeptics including some members of Congress. Around that time, hackers downloaded climate scientist emails, including Dr. Mann's, in the University of East Anglia Climate Gate scandal. Eventually came another public vindication, and along the way, Michael Mann became a public figure. And a lightning rod. He has admirers and critics for his outspokenness and, at times, pugilistic style. So why does he keep diving back into the fray? Well, we spoke with him at the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting, where he was presented with the award for public engagement with science. Well, I, I like, you know, engaging in efforts to communicate our science and its implications to the public. And so I, I enjoy talking with journalists and really anybody who's interested <laughs> about the science of climate change, um, the impacts, the challenges we face, the solutions. And I look for just about any means uh, available to, to communicate the science to the public. I'm going to push on that a little because that sounded a little more convivial than what some of these interactions end up being because you are tireless. So something else must be driving you other than your love of the science which you obviously possess. In a sense, I, I you know, never really intended to be devoting my life to communication and outreach and being in the public sphere. But uh, decades ago, when my co-authors and I published the now famous hockey stick curve, I found myself at the center of this raging uh, debate about human-caused climate change. And in the process of sort of being attacked because of this work and the prominence of this work being attacked by uh, those who deny uh, the reality of climate change, I, in a sense, was sort of forced into the public sphere. It wasn't of my own volition, uh, necessarily. You know, I have a daughter who's 12 years old. Uh, this is about what sort of world, what sort of planet we are going to leave behind for our children and grandchildren. So I suppose it isn't just my passion for explaining science and talking about science. It's also the stakes really couldn't be any higher um, when it comes to this issue. And it, I would be derelict in my responsibilities if I didn't take advantage of the opportunity that I have to inform this discussion. You're doing 
what few scientists are doing in speaking out. I mean, some scientists will say, I will collect the data, I will present those data, and that's as far as I'll go, because like journalists, scientists and journalists want to remain objective. But you are getting involved, and I'm wondering, in your opinion, when speaking the truth, presenting the facts, as you said, as you, as you do to the public, as you do to Congress, you have done to Congress, when that crosses over to become a political act? So my good friend Bill Nye uh, likes to say that science is political, but it's not partisan, which is to say, well, of course, there are matters of policy that must be informed by science. Climate change is an obvious example. This is a problem that in order to understand and address, we need to use our, our scientific understanding. So in today's world, unfortunately, uh, increasingly just saying that you accept the findings of the world's scientists with regard to climate change or evolution or any number of things is perceived as being political. In an atmosphere where even arguing the case for an evidence-based approach to policy is viewed as political, science has no choice but to be perceived by some as political. Well, you could say more than that, though, um, in terms of scientists getting involved politically, that scientists should not march, for example. That has come up recently in the, in the March for Science. Um, they should not sign petitions. They should not be advocating for any specific policy. Yeah, so, you know, as a scientist, I didn't check my citizenship at the lab door when I walked through. You know, yes, we're scientists, but we're also people who care about the world, <laughs> who care about the world we're leaving behind for our children, grandchildren, um, and we have as much right as anybody to express our views as citizens. Now, that gets at the issue of certainly uh, scientists have the right to advocate for an informed policy discourse over issues like climate change. I would argue that it's an abrogation of our responsibility to not do so. That can take us down a difficult sort of slippery slope where we have to decide what type of advocacy is appropriate. And different individuals, different scientists have different ideas about what is an appropriate sort of level of advocacy. My role as a scientist, I view my role as informing the policy debate, but not trying to prescribe what the policy solutions should look like. I trust politicians to do that in good faith as long as they can accept an objective assessment of what the science says about the risks. Do you trust them to do it in good faith? I ask that because you've been dragged into some political maelstroms that have gotten pretty nasty. And let's just take a recent example. In March 2017, you went before the House Science, Space and Technology Committee that really aimed to present climate change as a debate. They brought uh, climate change skeptics as witnesses. And I'm wondering what you hope to achieve by going before Congress and what those two hours were like. I believe one of the headlines, just one of many reports on this, Michael Mann versus the biggest global warming deniers in Congress. Yeah, and, and I, there was a conditional statement. Um, you know, I, I said I trust them to debate the policy solutions in good faith as long as they're willing to accept what the science has to say about the reality and, and threat and the risks. And in this case, for example, Lamar Smith of Texas is the chair of the House Science Committee, but he rejects the overwhelming consensus of the world's scientists when it comes to the scientific evidence for climate change. And so he doesn't meet that condition. So, so if, he, if he doesn't meet that, and you know that going in, why do you show up? Oh, well, I do think it's important for us to speak up, to speak truth to power. Here we have the chair of the House Science Committee who is engaged in an assault on science itself. And so I saw my role, even though, as you say, it was three to one, there were three witnesses for the Republicans. I was the sole witness for, for the Democrats. I felt like it wouldn't matter if it was a thousand to one, because I had this secret weapon going in, scientific truth. And I still have faith, and you can call it faith if you like, that ultimately facts do matter and facts will rule the day. And so I, I didn't feel that we could 
throw our hands up in defeat. I, I felt like the voice of the scientific community had to be present in that room, even if I was the only one providing that voice. And frankly, I, I felt pretty good about the way um, it played out because I think it was revealed. The hearing was revealed sort of for the sham that it was. I think that those arguing against the scientific consensus came out looking rather foolish. And if anything, it backfired. Today, the issue of climate change is a partisan one. But you have said that it hasn't always been so. In fact, you've worked with Republican congressmen in the past, I believe uh, former New York Representative Sherwood Bollert. So there was a time when it wasn't split between Democrat and Republican. You remember that time. What happened? Yeah, I mean, let, let's go down the list because it's worth doing. The EPA founded by Richard Nixon, Republican. The Clean Air Acts, Clean Water Acts founded during his presidency. The term cap and trade as a way of dealing with environmental problems. Uh, cap and trade was introduced by George Herbert Walker Bush, his EPA administrator, William K. Riley, who I look at as an environmental hero, really provided a framework for market-based solutions to dealing with environmental problems. And Ronald Reagan, uh, President Ronald Reagan signed the Montreal Protocol to ban chlorofluorocarbons, uh, these ozone-depleting chemicals. And so it wasn't always the case that support for environmental policies uh, broke down along strictly partisan lines. Sherwood Bullard was the chair of the House Science Committee, old school, pro-science, pro-environment Republican from upstate New York. Um, the chair of that committee at the time that I was being attacked by Joe Barton of Texas, who was the chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and this was back in 2005. And he attempted to essentially subpoena uh, all of my personal emails and every document from my scientific uh, career. He, he was hoping he could somehow find something to embarrass me uh, that he could use to discredit the hockey stick curve that had become this iconic symbol in the public discourse over climate change. And, and he probably would have been successful had it not been for Sherwood Bollert. Sherwood Bollert, the powerful chair of the House Science Committee, spoke out, it was vocal in denouncing this assault on science by his fellow uh, Republican, Joe Barton. Almost an unprecedented situation to have one prominent Republican call out another prominent Republican in such harsh terms, and he wasn't the only one. John McCain, shortly thereafter, wrote an op-ed in the Chronicle of Higher Education denouncing uh, stopping just short of calling out Joe Barton, his fellow Republican Joe Barton, for engaging in, in a witch hunt against uh, scientists whose findings might be inconvenient to the special interests who line Mr. Barton's pockets. So people are sometimes surprised. And I tell this story in, in my book, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. People are often surprised to learn that the biggest heroes in the story turn out to have been Republicans, not Democrats. And so it's a reminder that uh, it wasn't always the way it is now. Of course, right now we have a Republican administration that is literally trying to roll back the environmental progress of the last half century, policies put in place by Republican and Democratic administrations alike, and that's unprecedented. Let's talk a bit more about how far a scientist should go in getting involved and defending their work, defending their reputation as you've had to do. You are more than a science advocate, and some would make the case, in fact, a reporter I talked to today when I said I was going to talk to you calls you a street fighter. The idea is that you are blunt at times, and you are ready for the fight. And I, I looked at your Twitter feed, and you aren't above, you know, poking a finger in the eye of politicians and, and their politics. Um, does that cross a line for a scientist? Well, no, we all have to decide what feels appropriate to us. I feel strongly that what we're seeing right now is an abuse and rejection of science in policy in a way that really imperils us as a civilization. And so if we have an opportunity to push back at that and, and maybe halt this assault on, on science and reason, then in my view, again, it would be an abrogation of our responsibility to not do so. And what about the characterization of you as a, as a street fighter? 
Yeah, well, it's, it's funny uh, because there was actually an editorial after the uh, in 2009 when scientists' emails were stolen and climate change deniers uh, tried to use um, the stolen emails, uh, take uh, words and phrases out of context to, to misrepresent us, to try to discredit the science of climate change. At the time, the journal Nature, which is one of the most conservative institutions in science, uh, the oldest and most revered uh, scientific journal, published, you know, uh, Sir Isaac Newton work, I believe. The journal Nature wrote an editorial where they actually said that climate scientists need to recognize that they are in a street fight. <laughs> and the point was, you know, you didn't start the fight, but whether you like it or not, you're in one and you have to recognize that. And it's not for everyone. And I wouldn't encourage every scientist to follow the path that I've followed. Now, you've withstood attacks on your scientific methodology, your motivation, but also your person. You have defended yourself in a defamation lawsuit. You've had death threats and also threats made to your family. This is incredible. What is the toll that this has taken on you and perhaps your family in being this outspoken leading champion, one of the leading champions for science education and climate science? Yeah, well, it's there have been some tough times, um, and, and certainly any time when my family has been mentioned or threatened, that has caused me great concern. And frankly, those are things that were happening sort of at the height of the, this concerted uh, attack against climate scientists back in, in 2009, 2010. And much of that has subsided now. And I, I myself have grown a very thick skin and, and I can take it. And I understand that it's the cost of doing business. Um, if you're gonna be out there talking about the need to act on the climate crisis, you're going to be attacked. There's some very well-organized, very well-funded interests that are going to do whatever they can to attack you and to discredit you. But, you know, the cost of inaction here is far greater. Well, Michael Mann, I read once that when you got into science, it was because you were interested in the big picture. So it seems appropriate that you're speaking with big picture science. And we thank you. Uh, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Michael Mann is a professor of atmospheric science and director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University. Some scientists have found another path to lobby for evidence-based decision-making by running for Congress themselves. Michael Mann is on the advisory board of the nonprofit group 314 Action, which is helping them to do it. We'll hear from its founder, as well as a critic, next. It's our monthly look at critical thinking on Big Picture Science, Skeptic Check, Political Scientist. In a Frank Capra film, an idealistic Jimmy Stewart gives a passionate speech on the floor of the U.S. Congress. Because this country is bigger than the Taylors, or you, or me, or anything else. Great principles don't get lost once they come to light. They're right here. You just have to see them. We now have a twist on the classic, only it's Professor Smith that goes to Washington and he or she is a biologist or physicist or climate researcher. We lose some of the Capra idealism, but not all of it. A record number of scientists are now running for Congress, believing that their training and fresh perspective can make a difference. But what do pointy heads familiar with analyzing data sets know about crafting law on Capitol Hill? Well, maybe not much at first. I'm Shaughnessy Naughton, the founder and president of 314 Action. The nonprofit group 314 Action, yes, those are the first digits of pi, want to see fewer lawyers in Congress who currently make up more than 40% of members. And since lawyers represent 0.4% of the U.S. population, that means that they are 100 times overrepresented in Congress. 
you know, looking at the problems our country is facing, whether it's the future of work or climate change or cybersecurity or protecting the integrity of our elections, who better to tackle those problems than scientists and engineers? Dr. Naughton, chemist and former congressional candidate from Pennsylvania, says the goal of her nonprofit is not to politicize science, but to get scientists involved in politics. And the group is supporting candidates who are scientists. I think that we do benefit by having a diversity of experience. You know, when a scientist looks at a problem, one of the first questions that she'll ask is, well, what does the data show? As opposed to, you know, what does my political party tell me I should say about this? Scientists are trained problem solvers. They're also collaborators. And I think that both of those skills are sorely needed in Congress when you see threatened shutdowns almost monthly at this point. Having more people that are practical and focused on solutions, I think, would benefit us all. How many science candidates, Shaughnessy, uh, does 314 Action have under its wing at the present time? Well, last year we heard from about 7,000 scientists that are interested in attending our candidate training or running for office themselves. Currently, we're working with a couple dozen federal campaigns running mostly for the U.S. Congress, but some for the Senate as well. And what is their background in, in general? I mean, uh, technology, physical sciences, biological sciences, or is it kind of spread around? It's really spread around. You know, we have math and science teachers, physicians, technologists, professors, engineers, coming from a really wide background. So what are the specific science issues that are concerning you? I mean, uh, and your candidates for that matter. I mean, if they're not all biologists or they're not all climate scientists or they're not all engineers, give me some idea of the, the kind of issues that you think their input would be valuable to address. You know, it really depends on the individual candidate, but from the technologists, we hear a lot about what the future of work is going to look like, how automation is going to affect our economy and the American worker, how to address climate change. From some of our candidates that are physicians, obviously the Affordable Care Act is a big issue uh, and something that they can talk about with a lot of credibility, not just as a talking point. You know, even this most topical issue right now with the gun violence debate. There's been a effectively a 20-year ban on research, federally funded research, to reduce gun violence. And I think that, you know, that's something that we would see changed if we had more scientists in Congress. How, how do you support their candidacy? Well, we hold candidate trainings where we give them a peek behind the curtain as to what's involved in running for office and putting together a successful campaign, from putting together their fundraising plan and communication strategy to hiring staff and putting together their consultant team. And then we work with them along the way to make sure that they meet their goals, that we are working with national and local organizations that can help their campaigns. And then eventually we endorse where we write our own contribution and introduce them to our donor network throughout the country. Do you have a track record yet? Uh, can you say that we've done this for X candidates and Y fraction of them have actually won? Well, 2017 was really our, our first run. Those were mostly municipal races, but in New Jersey and Virginia, there were state assembly as well as statewide gubernatorial campaigns. And we endorsed in about 30 races in 2017. 20 of them were successful in their campaigns. That's a pretty high ratio, I would say. I mean, that's a very high ratio when you figure there is no second place in elections. You either win or you lose. Are the scientist candidates here uh, expected to stop their work as a scientist, or maybe they have to do that if they're elected? Is there uh, some sort of decision to keep the two disciplines separate? I can't imagine that you continue to crank out papers if you're, you know, in a legislature. In Congress. Right, if you're in Congress. I mean, and are scientists keen to halt their careers or do they realize they would have to halt their careers to uh, assume the mantle of being a politician? Well, it depends. You know, part of why we're so keen on seeing more scientists run for school committees and, and local offices is that it doesn't require a break from their career. But for running for a federal office like Congress, that does require a break. And mostly what we are seeing from the federal candidates is there has been a transition out of the lab prior to running. 
Now, Shaughnessy, when I look over the candidates that uh, your group supports, they're all Democrats. Have you chosen not to support Republicans? We have not. You know, when you look at the National Republican Party platform, uh, you can see how it would be perhaps more difficult for for scientists to run on a on a platform that is so against action on climate change, which is such a pressing issue right now. So of the candidates we've heard from, they have been Democrats and independents for the most part. But you would support a Republican scientist if, if that candidate came to you? Well, bring me the unicorn. Well, but, but I mean, but if that unicorn were brought to you, would you help them get elected? It's possible. Our candidate trainings are open to scientists of any political stripe. As far as contributing directly to a federal candidate, From the Republican Party, we do have a vehicle for doing that. We just have not had the reason to use it. Well, could this be a strategic blunder? I mean, if science is becoming increasingly politicized, and I hear you saying that, shouldn't efforts be made to depoliticize it? I mean, isn't 314 action kind of reinforcing the perception that scientists are politically opposed to Republicans? Well, we are a political organization. We're not a scientific organization. So there is a point where you do have to pick a side. You know, the fact that the Republican Party has become so hostile to action on climate change is a fairly new phenomenon and one that I would like to see changed (laughs) the sooner the better. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that Newt Gingrich, Republican House Speaker, was calling for action on climate change, that Donald Trump himself was taking out full page ads in The New York Times, imploring people on the importance of action on climate change. You know, it's really a testament to Republican politicians feeling more loyalty to special interests and campaign donors than to science and voters. The majority of Americans recognize the importance of acting on climate change, and uh, I, I do hope that they come around to that. Well, tell me specifically, I mean, how will increasing the number of Democratic scientists in Congress win Republicans over to their cause? I mean, it, you just you know dilute their effect because you have more of them, or is there something else going on here? Well, I think politicians uh, listen to two things, voters and campaign contributors. And for too long, you know, the scientific community has taken the approach that we'll just put the facts and evidence out there and that will be able to speak for itself. And politicians have shown us that they are unashamed to meddle in science. And we're not going to win that war by passively accepting that. We're going to win that war by challenging members of Congress and politicians who base policy on anything other than facts and evidence. Shaughnessy Naughton, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. Shaughnessy Naughton is the founder and president of 314 Action. I'm Alex Berzo, and I'm the Senior Fellow of Biomedical Science at the American Council on Science and Health and a PhD microbiologist. The nonprofit American Council on Science and Health is a pro-industry organization. Dr. Berzo says he too would like to see greater diversity in Congress, including scientists, but he is troubled by 314 Action's perceived support for only scientists who are Democrats. I don't think it's a good thing. Uh, While I applaud the idea of getting more scientists into Congress, we absolutely have to make sure that it's a bipartisan effort. Right now, the scientific community is skewing towards the Democratic Party. And if it ever becomes the case, and I think it actually already kind of is, that Republicans feel that the scientific community is lost to them, that will be a bad thing for science because Republicans will feel no need to reach out to scientists. Now, Shaughnessy Naughton makes the case that the reason that they're only supporting Democratic candidates is that the Republican platform is anti-science and specifically, as you might suspect, anti-climate change science. So she says that finding a Republican scientist to run for Congress is like uh, finding a unicorn. Is she right? No. If the Republican Party is anti-science, then the Democratic Party is anti-science as well. Yes, it is true that the Republicans are not big fans of climate change. But I live here in Seattle, where it is completely run by Democrats. And I can tell you for a fact that the anti-vaccine movement is popular here. The anti-GMO movement is popular here. There's a backlash against Western medicine here and an embrace of alternative medicine. These are opposed to the scientific community. Well, what about the fact that uh, this administration is frequently seen as being not welcoming to science, 
do you concur that uh, it disregards science advisors and the conclusions of research? I, I don't know if it's any worse than any other administration. It just seems to be more discombobulated and not well run, right? I mean, the, the Trump administration has not placed advisors in the State Department. We don't have an, an ambassador to South Korea, right? And so it seems to be that this is just sort of a disorganized administration. In the past, the Republican Party has actually been more sympathetic to funding basic research, at least, uh, than the Democrats. What, what's the deal here? Well, you know, that's that's part of the idea is that throughout history, uh, the Republicans have been very generous in their funding of science. But of course, recently with high profile skepticism towards things like climate change, the scientific community has become more hostile, openly hostile to the Republican Party. I don't think that's a good thing. I think it's better to try to bring as many diverse political viewpoints into the scientific fold as possible. Alex, what do you think? Is the election of scientists to Congress the most effective way to get science-based facts into the political process? Or should we just have more advisors or, or something else? Uh, yeah, I'm not actually convinced that electing scientists is the best way to do it. I, I think that having maybe more scientific advisors, as you suggested, having bipartisan panels that take the advice of scientists seriously and trying to depoliticize the scientific process. Uh, do you have any advice for 314 Action? Because uh, they think you guys are unicorns. Well, I'm not a Republican scientist, but I would like to see more centrists, which I am, uh, more Republicans, more Democrats, and anyone of any political viewpoint in the scientific community. Science should be for everybody. So what are the challenges, if any, for a Republican scientist to become politically active in this current climate? Would it be, you know, would it be any harder than for a Democrat? Uh, yeah, I think so, because there is a stigma uh, with being conservative in academia. If you look at scientists, there are about 6% of scientists say that they're Republicans. So if you go to academia, you know, conservatives are outnumbered on campus. So I think there's a political culture and a stigma associated with being a Republican or a conservative. So I think that, yes, it is more difficult for someone in that situation to stand up and say, hey, I disagree with the majority of you on, on various political stances. But do you think that that uh, proportion there is 6 percent are uh, self-declared Republicans? Could that just be uh, an effect of I don't know, they, they just don't want to admit to it or something, that there's some sort of social pressure not to say you're a Republican if you're a scientist? Or do you think it's for uh, real? Oh, I think that's real. I think the social pressure absolutely is real. But I also wouldn't doubt that there probably aren't that many Republicans in science. It's, you know, I think 20, 30, 40 years ago, you would have seen a different answer to that question. But I do think that the scientific community has become more and more and more democratic in its political outlook. Alex Berzo, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. It's been a tremendous honor. Alex Berzo is a senior fellow of biomedical science at the American Council on Science and Health. You know, in the old days, which is to say any days more than about 100 years ago, scientists didn't have dogs in any fights inside the Washington Beltway, but now they do because so much research is funded by the federal government. We began by asking if objectivity is harmed when scientists turn activists, and none of what we've heard suggests that scientists' research objectivity will be threatened. We also heard the opinion, though, that it may be that the perception of their objectivity is harmed, and that scientists, if they participate in politics, depending on what they're doing, may come off as another special interest group. That was one opinion. Yeah, but the suggestion to remedy that was to talk to your neighbors, get them to know the face of a scientist, and then they'll have more trust in us. Well, okay, if they trust their next-door neighbor who happens to be a scientist, maybe the politicians will follow because they're beholden to the, you know, the people that are your neighbors. But maybe that's too idealistic. Maybe the best thing to do is indeed just get more scientists into Congress where they can talk to the people who vote on things and say, look, this is what the data say. In the case of Michael Mann, his own research was being attacked. He's a climate scientist, and he was seeing you know, strange things happening, and he couldn't just pretend that it didn't happen. He had to get involved. Well, that's not only understandable, but it's commendable because this is science that has tremendous <laughs> impact on society. So it's a good thing that he got involved. I mean, we, we see this with other questions in science, like, you know, evolution or whatever, and you, you, you can't just leave it alone unless everybody understands the science. And that's really the question. How do we get everybody, including the Congress, to really understand the science and how science works? You've been called in front of Congress. Yes, twice. 
Does someone call you? Do you get an email? Well, in fact, uh, the chair of a committee invited me to speak. Well, how well, do they invite you? That's what I mean. Do they so, call you? Do they oh, send some, you know, G-men over and yes, escort they, you to Washington? Yes, they have G-men. No, in fact, uh, I got a phone call. I was asked if I could do it, and you don't say no. They don't pay your way. They don't even pay your taxi ride from the airport to uh, to the hill. You, you get a sandwich you, or something? or uh, I did get a sandwich, yeah. Did you enjoy the experience? Yes, certainly I enjoyed it. I mean, the question is, you know, did you help them? That's really what I was asking myself. Did I help them or did I not? And I, I don't know. It's hard to say. Thanks to the team who are motivated to get involved with Big Picture Science, Senior Producer Gary Niederhoff and Operations Manager Barbara Vance. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the behavior of the long lived sand dunes on Mars. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to our monthly look at critical thinking on Big Picture Science. This episode, Skeptic Check, Political Scientist. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science episodes, you'll find them in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. You can also find links there to our guests. And if you're a podcast listener, but actually prefer listening to over-the-air radio because you like to carry a boombox at marches, check out the listing on our website of the more than 140 stations that carry the program. And if your local radio station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. If you never want to miss an episode, subscribe to Bye Pi Sci on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or iHeartRadio. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. And to reach us directly with your comments, and be sure to throw in some faint or even luminous praise, email it all to bigpicturescienceatseti.org. Skeptic Check is brought to you thanks to a generous grant from the Trimberger Family Foundation. At the Trimberger Family Foundation, we hold that skepticism is a lamp that lights the way to truth. Trimberger.org.